Mr. Pernon and Ms. King, are we ready to begin? I believe so. Thank you. The first uh, thing in our agenda is a public hearing. The public hearing held by the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control Board is called to order and is being held pursuant to KRS Chapter 77 and district regulations. Notice that this hearing has been published pursuant to state law. This public hearing is being held via video teleconference. Instructions making written and oral statements via video teleconference have been distributed. Oral statements must be presented today. Statements should be concise. All statements will be become part of the hearing record. There is one agreed board order to be reviewed today. Would the staff please present the agreed board order with Heritage Green Holding LLC? Mr. Gavette. Chairman Sullivan, board members, the district ranks for the board's consideration an agreement with Heritage Green Holdings LLC, which owns the Heritage Green Apartment Complex in South Louisville. The apartment complex has been undergoing stages of renovation since 2015. The district alleges that Heritage Green failed to perform a thorough inspection for asbestos prior to conducting renovations, failed to provide notice to the district in advance of the renovations, and disturbed asbestos without following work practice standards required by federal rules for asbestos. On August 3rd, 2020, District Compliance Officer Regina Freeman conducted an inspection at the Heritage Green Apartment Complex and observed a large uncovered pile of potential asbestos containing material and took samples from the pile to send for lab analysis. Before leaving, she advised the general contractor that the pile needed to be kept wet and covered until it could be cleaned up. Results of the lab analysis were received a few days later, confirming the presence of asbestos materials in the pile. On August 17, 2020, the district conducted a follow-up inspection and observed that the pile had not been covered or wetted. After this inspection, Heritage Green contracted Pinnacle Environmental Group, Inc., a local licensed asbestos contractor to clean up the debris pile in renovated areas. The district has continued to perform inspections at Heritage Green Apartment Complex to monitor for any renovations being performed. The company has retained the services of Pinnacle Environmental Group and complied with requirements of the asbestos abatement where needed. One public comment was received by the district during the written public comment period. This comment and the district's response were provided to the board before today's hearing for consideration by board members. The company has agreed to pay a penalty of $22,500 to resolve this notice of violation. Once the settlement agreement was reached, Heritage Green began making payments towards the penalty amount. Due to Louisville Metro Office of Management budget policies, these checks were processed and deposited. If the board rejects this order, these payments will be refunded to Heritage Green. The district recommends that the board adopt the order as written. Thank you. Ms. King has a representative of Heritage Green Holdings for registered to make a statement. We have not. Thank you. Ms. King, is any member of the public registered to make an oral statement? Yes, Chairman Sullivan. Rebecca Katz. Please stand by and state your name again. Yes, my name is Rebecca Katz. Well, your affiliation. Sure, I'm the legislative aide for Metro Council District 21, where Heritage Green is located. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to say today that our district desperately needs dignified, safe, healthy housing. And um, it's distressing that this is such a large apartment complex that can house many of our vulnerable neighbors. Um, our district is home to a very diverse population. Um, diverse in um, national origin, diverse in socioeconomic status and income. Um, Heritage Green is one of the spaces that uh, many people are able to rent, but it, it doesn't uh, help when um, there are potential health issues um, in relation to the apartment complex. Um, and we just, we, everyone in our district deserves more than, um, than asbestos in, in the houses that we, that we live in. Thank you. Nope. Ms. King, is any member of the public submitted a written statement? I received that. Thank you. Are there any members of the public in the Edison room that wish to make a comment? If so, please raise your hand. Are, they, uh, are there any members of the public that wish to make a brief comment on this video teleconference? Please raise your hand via video teleconference. You'll be called on this feature. This is a feature you can find on the participants list 
for pressing star three if joining by phone and you would be called upon. But you don't see anything. Okay. Thank you. Or any questions from board members? Thank you. Before we call the regular meeting to order, Ms. Hamilton has a comment she'd like to make. Very important comment. It is with great regret that I announced the restrooms are broken again. We're need to use the restroom until we need to go to the third floor. The elevator is at the end of the lobby here. Bathrooms are all the way to the back of the hall. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will uh, now call the regular meeting of the Louisville Air Pollution Control Board to order. We are conducting the media, the monthly board meeting today via video teleconference. I will conduct a roll call of board members that are present on this teleconference. When I call your name, please say here. Carl Hilton cannot join us this morning. Dr. Jeffrey Coburn, I do not believe is in attendance. Dr. Joseph Josephine May, as well as not in attendance. Candace Show White. Here. Here. Thank you. Marissa Neal. Dr. Daniel Garth. Here. Thank you. Ms. Hamilton, any introductions this morning? Uh, yes. Actually, this morning we are joined this morning by Ms. Betsy Rui. Welcome. Public recognitions, Ms. Hamilton. And none today. The minutes of the regular meeting held on April 19, 2023, were distributed electronically for review. Are there any changes to the minutes by the board? Thank you. Moving on to the public comment section, Mrs. Uh, King, has anyone registered uh, to make a comment? Has anyone uh, provided written comments? Okay. Are there any members of the public in the Edison room that wish to make a comment? If so, please raise your hand. Are there any other members of the public that wish to make a brief comment on this video teleconference? Please raise your hand via, uh, via video teleconference you'll be called upon. This is a feature you can find on a participants list or pressing star three. If joined by phone, you'll be called upon. Okay. Thank you. That completes the public comment portion of the meeting. Moving on to unfinished business. Uh, there is no unfinished business. A new business uh, is the agreed board order. The district has recommended that the board adopt the agreed board order with Heritage Green Holdings LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the regulation package? So is there a second? Thank you. But any discussion? Yeah, sorry, that was a oh, mistake. Sorry. That was, should have been um, a motion not to adopt the regulation package, but the motion to adopt the agreed board order. Okay. Let's sure. back up. Is there a motion to adopt the agreed board order? So, I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? Thank you. We'll now take a roll call vote. Please unmute your mic and say yes if you wish to adopt the agreed board order with Heritage Green Holdings and no if you do not. Candace Show White. Yes. Marissa Neal. Yes. Dr. Daniel Garst. Yes. I vote yes. The agreed board order with Heritage Green Holdings is adopted. On committee reports, I don't believe any committees met the previous month. So we'll move on to the staff reports and we'll start with Ms. Hamilton in the director report. Okay. So good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. The restroom is not standing. So as many of you know, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've been busy with travel. We actually came to you all last month from Chicago, the National Air Toxic Conference that Matt King, Michelle King, and I attended. The three day conference was both informative and extremely um, engaging. I'm glad that we were able to take a number of people and actually cover the three tracks that they were running concurrently, covering new technology and equipment 
risk communication and new policies and regulatory proposals. It's always comforting when we go to these uh, conferences and we're around our national peers. This work is really challenging. And when you're with people who are also doing it, you realize you have common problems together. You share best practices. You can also share your lessons learned. Uh, and sometimes those may be the best stories to share. But I think we always come back feeling very engaged and really ready to do this work. Of course, the focus of the conference was air toxics. One thing I can tell you is that the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control District is really quite unique in the strategic toxic air reduction program that the board adopted in 2005. We heard from many of our other state partners who have also developed air toxics programs to go beyond the federal air toxics rules. And we do them looking at the air toxics in very similar uh, toxicological ways and technical ways, but the way we apply those rules to sources really varies. You apply those rules to existing sources. Many apply those rules to new but really big sources. And again, we are still, as far as we can tell, the only local air program in the nation applying any air toxics rules beyond the federal programs. This conference was the first in 17 years. We had a lot to talk about. Given the feedback that EPA has gotten, they've agreed they'll do this more frequently, uh, and that will be good for everybody. This is really the place where we're beginning to see the strategy of dealing with one pollutant at a time. Criteria sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, lead, and then air toxics as if they were something separate. Really, is it going to work going forward uh, as well? Because we've got a lot of the low hanging fruit for trimming around the edges where we can trim things together, and pull them together to get really good bang for the buck. We're all going to have to work towards that. After returning from Chicago the next week, Michelle, Michelle King, APCB's Director of Program Planning and Executive Administrator, and I traveled to Atlanta for the Spring Metro 4 CESAR Air Directors Meeting. Metro 4 CESAR is our multi jurisdictional organization. They represent 10 southeastern states and 14 local programs. They help us stay up to date on our skills and our training, and they are also an advocate for us, both in regional planning and also with US EPA. That was a great meeting. It focused on grants and planning. We got to see our EPA region four counterparts and spend some time with them. Uh, we did receive slight increase to our EPA grant. It's about 5% uh, overall. EPA provides about 12% of our budget in a grant that supports our day-to-day -day operations and also our air monitoring program. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Do you request an amount, an increase, or do they just no. kind of arbitrarily uh, give it to you? So it's not quite arbitrary. The amount uh, is something that they work through their budget process. There is a formula that they use to allocate to state and local programs. Uh, and that allocation is periodically reviewed. Uh, but this one is same allocation we've been using for the past couple of years. Oh, I'm sorry, so we'll send it across the board, 5%. It's for our Section 105 grant that supports the day-to-day -day operations, but everyone has that grant for the specific yes. just here. Everyone has that, that, that grant across the board, 5%. And a slightly smaller increase to the Section 103 grant that actually supports our air monitoring program. So in June, We'll actually be welcoming a group of Metro 4 SESARM peers here through a Metro 4 SESARM training. And Matt, remind me again, that training is on? ATCs and controls. Okay, so there'll be a training here with our uh, 10 state, 14 local counterparts on VOCs and their controls that Metro 4 SESARM is providing to the region. After returning from Atlanta, we had Derby, which was a very nice break. And then Ms. King traveled again to Colorado to attend the spring technical and policy meeting of the National Association for Clean Air Agencies, or NACA, our national advocacy partner, where she presented on the Air Quality Action Partner Program during a panel presentation on innovative initiatives from state and local air agencies. 
we're a little road weary at this point, uh, but we are glad to have had a chance to talk with everybody and hear what other folks are doing. It keeps our work fresh, certainly gives us new ideas to take forward. So, in addition to all this travel, uh, I don't know. I don't know how we got to May 15th. I'll be candid. This year has just gone by in a blur. One of our commitments for our equity work uh, for 2013 was to complete 20 engagements with the community in a year. I think we may finish them all here in May. We've had a tremendous number of opportunities already this month to meet with people, and that includes uh, meeting with the Greater Global Inc who asked for an update last week on the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and our environmental justice work. The Rubbertown Community Advisory Council, who asked for an update on odors and also on new tools that we're working with US EPA on. The West Jefferson County Community Task Force, who met last night, Matt King presented on the district's permitting program. We were also joined there by a colleague from Planning and Design who presented on zoning. It was a really great meeting. Tonight, there is a Global Sustainability Council Green Drink event, which will focus on the district and our work. I hear that there is actually going to be some APCD focused trivia, but there will be drinks, so you can come out and join us. And then tomorrow night is the next Mayor's Night Out at the South Global Community Center on Taylor Boulevard. As I said, we set a goal for 20. Um, I've got a quarter of those out of the way this month. We're well on our way to exceeding that goal this year, which is great. So after last, at last month's board meeting, Vice Chairman Sullivan asked how the American Lung Association grades an air and areas air quality in their state of the air report. So Ms. King has looked into that. Turn it over to her. Clear a little bit of an overview. Um, so again, the question was, um, why does the Louisville area receive failing or poor grades for air quality from the American Lung Association when our uh, air monitoring network is monitoring attainment of all of the NACs? So um, just for a recap, if you haven't seen the report um, in that 2023 report released earlier this spring, um, for ozone, ALA assigned us an F for 24 hour PM 2.5 fine particulates. We received a C and we received a pass um, for annual PM 2.5. So I just wanted to uh, first note that the ALA uses the same data as our design values, and that's um, the design values are the basis of our attainment status. But they use a different type of grading system, and that meets their goal for advocating for cleaner air through more stringent air pollution regulation and proactive policies by government. Our use of this data is to demonstrate that we meet the regulatory framework for the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs. So EPA's attainment designation is at its first cut um, an in or an out kind of standard. If the area's design value is at or under the NACs, the area is in attainment, period. Um, if it's not, there are varying degrees of non-attainment from marginal to severe. And the method for calculating the design value is included in the regulation that sets the NAC for each pollutant. So that can be a different calculation um, for uh, each design value. Your monthly um, air quality report that's in uh, the board packets and that are posted um, at each month on our website has a really nice summary for the design value criteria for each of the pollutants that we include in that report, which are those that we are maintenance or non-attainment or have been non-attainment for. So if you look at ozone specifically as an example, you'll see the design value um, that's compared to the NACs to determine our attainment or non-attainment status is calculated with the three-year average of the annual fourth highest daily maximum, eight-hour average ozone concentration at each monitor. That's a lot, um, but that three-year average is the design value for each monitor. And then the Louisville MSA design value is the highest among all of those for all of the monitors in the MSA. American Lung Association system, however, the grades, um, they grade the area on a scale that can see an area like Louisville that is currently monitoring attainment of an ax like ozone, still receiving a failing grade overall. And again, their purpose for this grading system is different. So it meets their goal of highlighting the need to continue improving air quality which is, of course, a goal that we share. 
following that ozone example then. So while the design value is based on the four highest max concentration, the ALA uses a scale that includes all exceedances of the standard and then weights them according to the degree of the exceedance as characterized by the air quality index. So that's um, what you may see us uh, use in our air quality alert forecast that uh, the day is expected to exceed this, the NACs. It may be unhealthy for sensitive groups. That's that first category of orange and the unhealthy is right beyond that. So um, in other words, so that day that reached that unhealthy on the AQI, that red category would receive more weight in this grading than the unhealthy for sensitive groups, which is that orange category. That's the first category over the standard and that's the level at which Louisville would typically be if we see an exceedance. They total up those weighted days, divide them by three for the grade. That's because there's a three year period in the report. So for that three year uh, period in the report, um, 2019 through 2021, ALA counted 11 exceedance days, each at that lowest category, totaled up, divided by three, and it put it in the range that they assigned an F to. So again, this is their grading system. Uh, a similar count of AQI categories and weighted average was used for the 24 hour fine particulates and resulted in us getting a C. Um, we are also meeting that standard, but we had fewer days that saw exceedances um, than we did for ozone in that three year period. Now, on the other hand, you notice that for annual PM, they gave us a pass. That they just use a pass fail because there is no daily AQI calculated for an annual standard. So the ALA's methodology is basically the same as the attainment designation pass or fail based on whether you're in attainment. So again, those grades are based on the same data. They use the air monitoring data that we and other state and local air agencies gather and report to EPA, but they use a different data analysis method to compare areas to either the NACs, as EPA does, or as ALA does to other cities and metropolitan areas. And they have different purposes. The purposes are clear for both the EPA, which is a legal designation that may trigger some additional requirements for an area, or for the ALA, which is advocacy. But it really underscores the need to understand methodology behind these kinds of rankings that we see and consider the source and the treatment of the data that are used to reach the stated conclusions. If you all have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer. Follow back up if needed. You know, my concern was the, the PR nature of the report. To population, your own population. Do you get blowback from that type of stuff? I mean, are you, do you? We, we certainly, I, know, I think it certainly generates discussion. Right. Um, it um, again meets their goal of kind of uh, building a, a voice for advocacy for more stringent um, air pollution regulation and um, you know cleaner air. They have a broad goal around lung health, um, but air pollution is certainly a big part of their platform. So um, having this kind of grading system that, and the PR that goes with it absolutely gets people's attention. Um, it's less wonky than attainment, non-attainment, those kind of regulatory max things like that that we talk about. So um, it really meets their goal. Um, and, and I think that's the key here. And to the extent that they're um, generating conversation and concern around air quality, um, we hope that our outreach efforts can direct our information, our resources, and our public comment and uh, participation opportunities to those folks that are hearing that and voicing some concern. So, um, to the extent that you know we have the ability to capitalize on um, the, the conversation that gets generated by this report, I, I think that it's probably a good thing for air quality and. For I'll second that. If it brings interested people together and we have an opportunity to have that conversation with them about air quality, you know, public participation really is a hallmark of environmental regulation, and there's no other place than here where that's important because, of course, it helps us set our mission, our goals, our rules, um, and then, of course, the sources that locate here. So, moving on, there's been a lot of talk in public about air sensors. And advances in air sensor technology are providing new tools, including low cost air pollution monitors for assessing air pollution and other environmental factors. And these low cost sensors are a way for um, 
providing users with a simpler and quick way to determine levels of some air pollutants and other environmental factors. Importantly, these sensors, smaller, more accessible to the public, a little easier interface. They're really less expensive than our air monitoring equipment, our regulatory equipment, and they're not as accurate. Even in the last five years, we've seen substantial improvement in these sensors. They can be really informative. Potential uses for new air sensor technologies include science education, supplementing regulatory air quality measurements, conducting research, measuring local air quality to better understand if there's a hot spot or a source that's creating a hot spot of pollution. It can also be used to find leaks from equipment. You may remember in the fall that I reported to the board that the district had applied for a grant to US EPA for an air sensor lending library. We got very close. We recently received a non competitive grant from US EPA. It simply requires us to develop a plan to use that money. So we prepared that plan to use that money for an air sensor lending library. It does require approval from US EPA. And so later this summer, we'll come back. We'll provide you with a more in-depth look at air sensor and air sensor technology, maybe June, July timeframe, and also let you know where we are with US EPA in terms of approving that plan or not. For those of you who are interested, air sensors are being used nationally. A lot of weather uh, TV stations have a purple air mount that they use as part of their daily forecast. During the wildfires in California. The regulatory monitors were supplemented by purple air monitors in areas experiencing those wildfires. And even here locally, we have a homeowners association put up a network of purple air monitors. The nice thing about those is they are really simple to use. They also have a way to interface with the national network. So we actually see those monitors. They are on the EPA Air Now Smoke Sense Map. EPA applies a correction factor to the data to make it align better with our regulatory numbers. We review that data. We actually watch that map. What we see right now and what we've been seeing is that those air monitors really correlate nicely with our regulatory air monitors. But that five monitor, sorry, five sensor array is something that if we were to detect a hot spot, would let us know we need to look a little deeper. So uh, we're seeing this you know, crop up in a lot of places across the nation and our own Tom Law, our air monitoring program supervisor, project supervisor, is part of a US EPA national working group steering committee on the development and use of these sensors. We've been using some in our own work um, we also have two groups, two separate groups of USDB researchers coming in the next two weeks, and we'll report that work to the board at the June board meeting to come in and help install some sensors for an APCD led project looking at volatile organic compounds, and also an EPA led project looking at odors. So, again, we'll report on that to the board in. Are these things very big? Really? Uh, typically, no, they're quite small. They depend on the gluten and the extra you got with them. The sensors themselves are very tight. Nice. The, the size comes in, how it transmits data, how it saves data, how it's powered in this kind of sense. Could you bring one for show and tell? Absolutely. We'll bring several. Okay, cool. That is one of the best parts of this. Um, the ones that EPA are going to be using are a little bit larger, not so much the sensor, but the fact that it's connected to a canister. Canister technology is old technology, but the way that we're going to actuate that canister is new. We're going to use sensors to open the canister when it detects a plume of volatile organic compounds, or we hope when it's crowdsourced through an app experiencing odors. On April 30th of this year, the air monitoring program completed and submitted its certification of the 2022 air monitoring data work for our network. We are required to certify our data by May 1st of each year to ensure that the data we collect is valid and of high quality. My thanks to all the air monitoring staff and Billy DeWitt for completing this work 
and acquiring and validating the more than 45 million data points that we acquire each year. Uh, I will note that several of their staff members took a well-deserved vacation last week. The local statistical area is meeting all the national ambient air quality standards based on monitoring data. As you know, on April 18th, EPA proposed redesignating the area to attainment. The public comment period for that proposal will end tomorrow. Once EPA reviews and responds to any comments that they may have received, we expect to see final approval later this summer. And I don't really have a date certain. I will remind everyone that uh, when EPA says something is imminent, uh, it may be several months. Other things that are happening. On May 8th, EPA proposed Clean Air Act emission limits and guidelines for carbon dioxide from fossil fuel powered, fossil fuel fired powered plants. According to EPA, these rules are based on a cost effective and available control technologies. They set limits for new gas fired combustion turbines, existing coal, oil, and gas fired steam generating units, and certain existing gas fired combustion turbines. I'll note this is the fourth proposal we've seen uh, to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from this source sector. EPA indicates that the proposed standards are based on technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration, low greenhouse gas hydrogen co-firing, and natural gas co-firing, which can be applied directly to power plants that use fossil fuels to generate electricity. The proposal has not yet been published in the Federal Register but there will be a 60 day public comment period that will start once it's published. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and begin our review of that regulatory proposal, and we will come back to the board with a deeper dive later this summer, hopefully within that public comment period. At last night's West Jefferson County Community Task Force meeting, uh, Representatives from MSD asked to give an update on their odor work. And at that time, they indicated that they had gone back to Park Duval, where the board had ordered them to uh, correct and repair catch basins that were untrapped to report that they had identified some additional catch basins that needed to be uh, repaired with a, a new port to allow them to put a camera for clear blockage behind the trap. They also indicated that uh, work in the California neighborhood is ongoing. They didn't have a full report as to its completion, and they wanted to be sure that uh, people there understood that they had heard the message that they needed to address these odors. So with that, I do have a presentation today. Uh, for those of you not in the Edison room this morning. At the far end of the room, there are six reams of paper. The ream of paper contains 500 sheets. The proposal that I'm going to talk about between the regulatory proposal, the risk assessment, I apologize for the noise. And then the regulatory red line strikeouts for each of the rules involved in this particular proposal. Together, they total 2,900 pages. That's 3,000 pages there. So I may have mentioned that this is a big proposal, but I didn't really mean volume. I really mean an impact. So I'm going to spend some time walking through it in general. It's so big. We've had a team of people looking at it. It's still going to take us more time. The public comment period for this is open. This is important for people in Louisville to understand as best we can and comment to EPA uh, about how this program uh, should be finalized and finalized on time. Okay. I'll read the title. Forgive me. This is the Synthetic Organic Chemical Manufacturing Industry Organic National Emission Standard for Hazardous Air Pollutant or NESHAP. And the 
group one and two polymers and resins industry proposal. So this is a tremendously big title for a tremendously big text like this. Okay, what we're talking about today are federal air toxics. In 1990, when the Clean Air Act was amended, Congress came to EPA and said, great, you guys have been working for 20 years on these criteria pollutants that seems to be going okay. Now you need to address emissions of air toxics. Next slide. The approach that EPA took here is a two-pronged approach. The first thing they did was go out and look at the technology. So they went out, they looked at all the sources in existence, they got uh, technical information about the equipment. They got stack testing information about the equipment and its emissions. And they went through a process to identify the best technology in use. And that set that MAC standard. Separate from that, they go back <laughs> with a second approach to look at the residual risk. Once they have that technology in place, what's the risk that remains? They do a residual risk analysis. Much like you're familiar with the criteria pollutant part of the Clean Air Act, this too is a continuous improvement program. Every eight years, EPA is required to go back and look at whether or not that technology and that risk, residual risk, is still acceptable to human health and the environment. The unique thing here is that when we're working with criteria pollutants, we're working with everybody. What we see at the monitor, the monitor is not selected. It doesn't know if that emission is coming from a facility or a car or our houses or a roadway. It just knows that it's in the air and we have to address that emission in order to bring the area into a team. Different here, in addition to this two pronged approach, EPA is looking at 28 source sectors. And that's where we get to the synthetic organic chemical manufacturing industry. That's one source sector. And then we have this group one and two polymer and resin industry, which is a second type of source sector. In total, there are 28, but there can also be case by case MAC determinations where necessary. Next slide. Please. This is basically the time frame here. There are both national emission standards for hazardous organic substances rules in play here or NESHAPs, but there are also new source performance standards that are also aimed at reducing air toxics. Kind of the important one for us here is that the initial air toxics rule that we're going to be talking about being revised was proposed in 1995. And there have been some subsequent amendments over time, but nothing is sweeping as this. This 2023 proposal uh, from a regulatory rulemaking standpoint, happened with lightning speed. In 2022, US EPA identified that there are a couple of specific chemicals that are riskier than they understood. And in particular, those chemicals are ethylene oxide and chlorophyll. And that was really the driver for this kind of almost multi pollutant approach to air toxics. Next, sorry, next slide. So basically, this is a list of the equipment that are covered in the rules that we're talking about today. They're really too small to read. I'm going to come up here and read them for folks in the room so you can get an idea of what we're talking about. They are heat exchange systems, process beds, storage vessels, transfer racks, wastewater streams, equipment links. And that's common throughout both the as this organic niche up for that soft meat gun category, the polymer and resins group one and group two. Now, various equipment pieces parts under the polymer and resins group one and group two are covered depending on the source, but it's the same equipment. Next slide. So on April 25th, US EPA published these sweeping changes to the existing rules and proposed several new rules to reduce toxic air emissions from chemical manufacturers in the synthetic chemical manufacturing industry in the group one and two polymer and resins industry. It's really small. 
I would have just finished from up here. <laughs> All right. That's what you think about this source sector. It has made chemicals, what they make. There are other uh, ethylene oxide. It's not used to make chemicals or other products. It's primarily used to sterilize equipment, primarily medical equipment. Uh, so think about it, if you have a knee replacement, ethylene oxide is used to uh, sterilize that equipment and before it actually goes in to you. So that's a good thing. Probably is this really risky. There are other, there are more than 220 sources in this source sector that are subject to this rule. Nationwide. Me? Nationwide. 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 And the proposed rule, as I mentioned, it's not a rule, which again is pretty really different. It's several rules, and they have for about 3,000 pages. Next slide. What you'll see here, this is where those 220 sources are located. They are predominantly not located mostly in Texas and in Louisiana. One of the problems with the rule of this size is 60 days to read all that, to really prepare comments. And for us, it's really important that we look at that regulatory text. This was passed by, well, proposed by EPA in lightning speed. We want to make sure that what they say this rule is going to do does it when we read the regulatory text, because we're the ones who are going to be applying that in permit. So it's really incumbent on us to take some time to read this. That's a lot to read. So one of the things that we're going to be letting EPA know is we'd like a little bit more time. And I encourage people in the community who may also want to comment, please let EPA know if you'd like more time. Because this these rules do not have national applicability, but they are located within certain geographic areas. We don't have the typical uh, support of our all of our peers to tell EPA, no, 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 we need a little bit more time. They're going to have to hear from us. And it's important for people in Kentucky. Next slide. And again, that's 60 days to review. Yes. That's the time period to up. Yes. Isn't that intuitively obvious that it's not enough time to them? Wonderful, but I guess not. So, one thing that you know, APCD is hearing from our community is that we speak a different language, and sometimes that that language makes it really difficult for people to be engaged with the work. I know how they feel. I have spent more weekends with this particular regulatory package, and even though I'm fluent in acronyms. To some extent, I have more handwritten flow charts to make sense of what I'm reading than I've ever had on any regulatory provision. And every time I pick it up, I feel like I'm, you know, reading something in French, and I've got to get out my French to English dictionary to be sure I understand it. Sixty days is a challenge on simpler rules. On this one, it's nearly impossible. We will be asking for more time. So one of the things that EPA did here, and that national map that I just showed you, is they have completed what they're calling the first of its kind community-based risk assessment for the hog. And I found it really interesting that executive summary for the risk assessment is only 85 pages. So if you're interested, it can help you go to sleep tonight. But it does explain in great detail that what EPA did was take the 222 sources, look at the chemicals they emitted, and then determine that 60 chemicals were emitted in common from this source sector, and that those 60 common chemicals made up 98% by weight or mass of the emissions from this source sector. So they looked at the emissions of those 60 chemicals. What they propose will happen with this rulemaking is that overall there will be 6,053 fewer tons of air toxics emitted each year. And that includes 58 tons of ethylene oxide and 14 tons of chlorophyll. We'll talk a little bit more about those chemicals involved here in just a moment. Overall, there will be a volatile organic chemical reduction of about 23 and a half. 
23,500 tons per year. The bars here represent the risk. EPA has estimated that for some communities, particularly those where there are ethylene oxide and chlorine emissions, that the risk for those communities may exceed 2,000 in a million. After controls, EPA believes that the risk will reduce to the orange, nearer to their acceptable risk range of 100 in a million. Next slide, please. There are 10 facilities in Kentucky that at the time EPA developed this rule, they believe would be subject to this particular rulemaking. Six of these are outside of Jefferson County. There are only four here in Louisville. Please note, not all of these sources will be required to do fence line monitoring. And names of companies have changed. In particular, here in Louisville, we have Xeon Chemicals, Comores, American Synthetic Rubber, and Hexion, which is now a what? Next slide, please. What this proposal would do for the 222 companies, including the four here in Louisville, it would require any of those sources that emit ethylene oxide, chlorophyll, benzene, one three butadiene, ethylene dichloride, or vinyl chloride to conduct enzyme monitoring. For benzene, one three butadiene, and ethylene dichloride and vinyl chloride, it will be done using a passive sampler. Uh, that's what this fancy looking PVC cap looks like you made it at Home Depot is. It's not the outside that's important, it's the magic that happens inside. There are carbon absorbent tubes that are inside of that cap. They will be placed on all four corners of the facility. They'll hang in the field for two weeks, and then they'll be sent off to a certified lab for analysis. If a company receives data that indicates that they have triggered a threshold amount, which for one three butadiene will be three micrograms per cubic meter. The company has 45 days to conduct a root cause analysis to identify leaks or some other operational upset that may have caused that excessive emission. If they can't repair after 45 days to find that leak, then within 60 days from receiving back that data, they have to have a plan in hand in order to fix and repair. The companies will also be required to provide that data to US EPA every 45 days. EPA will then be responsible for putting that data up on a national publicly accessible website. And this is very similar to what they have been doing for years in the refinery source sector. They will need to make some modifications to the test method. That's method 325 for those little sorted tubes. Uh, it's my understanding for one through dying that they will be proposing that rule refinement uh, shortly. Ethylene oxide and chlorophyll won't be fence line monitored using this passive system. We'll actually have canisters that will be placed around their facility, and then the same process will follow through. And that's because of the difficulty in monitoring ethylene oxide. It's been a real challenge when EPA determined this chemical was riskier uh, than they expected. They wanted to understand from a community monitor approach what the exposure was, and they, they really struggled to find a method that would go low enough to address the risk and yet still provide valid data. Chlorophyll, again, Going to be monitored at the fence line with canisters. Next slide. Take a minute here to really talk about those six chemicals that are subject to that fence line monitoring. What you see on the slide, again, I apologize that it's small, but it's big enough to understand. The green represents emissions of, in this case, benzene in the state of Kentucky, minus the contribution from Louisville which is shown in the blue. The data starts in 1999. That's when the West Jefferson County Community Task Force came to 
leadership in both uh, state government and ABC and the health department is that we have concerns about what we're being exposed to. The next data point is 2000, which is the year the West Louisville Air Toxic Study began. 2003 is when the district proposed the STAR program, and many companies took voluntary efforts to reduce their emissions at that time. American Synthetic Rubber Company, for example, installed their glare thermal oxidizer. Uh, other companies reduced the amount of 139 that they were using or eliminated it completely from their own production. So for benzene, what we see here in Louisville is it's been pretty steady since 1999. Although we're in 2021, we do see a substantial reduction. And these bars represent pounds in thousands. <laughs> Next slide. This is the slide for 13 here today. And so what you'll see is that in 1999, there's about 231,000 pounds of one through you today committed here at Louisville. Very little out in the state. In 2003, I'm sorry, in 2000, when the start in West Louisville Air Toxins study was being conducted, it's about 120,000 pounds. In 2003, when the district had proposed the SAR program, there's more reductions. In 2005, you get to see the effect, of the installation of that flare thermal oxidizer. And then here in 2009, you see it's very well controlled. That's about 9,000 pounds of one through new dying. And those are from multiple sources here in Jefferson County, not just American Synthetic Rubber Company. And of course, in 2021, even less. One through new dying was in the West Global Air Toxic Study, identified as the cancer driver. It's the, the most uh, carcinogenic chemical that was detected and analyzed at that time. Next slide. Fort Green, however, is a different story. In the West Global Air Toxic Study, it was the non cancer driver in the initial 2000 to 2001 risk assessment. In a later risk assessment, which is available on our website, if you're interested, section 6.5 of that report details the discussion there of its treatment as a carcinogen. In 2005, the district in a risk assessment analyzed chlorophyll as a carcinogen. And had it been identified as a carcinogen in the original West Louisville Air Toxic Study, uh, there are several monitoring sites where its emissions are multiple times more than the cumulative total of all carcinogens at that site. So the district recognized before US EPA took action to even assess the cancer unit risk estimate, even really dig in and look at what the risk, how risky for the green might be. Uh, the store program really took a hard look at it as a carcinogen before it came in. And as a result, what happened here is it's 1999, that's 572,000 pounds of board green. Uh, in 2005, when star passed, that's 414,000 pounds. In 2009, the regulatory requirements um, were required for companies subject to star. Company had closed and moved their operations uh, to Louisiana. And since then, there are no emissions in Louisville. There are roughly 18 pounds of emissions from a source in Kentucky, and that's been consistent um, for years. Next slide. Okay, so this is one, two, it's one, two dichloroethylene. It should be one, two dichloroethane. Ethylene dichloride is also known as one, two dichloroethane. It's going to look something like this uh, here in Louisville. We'll make sure that this gets corrected when we get it up on the website. There aren't substantial emissions here in Louisville. This is out of the state. Next slide. 
And finally, this is ethylene oxide. This is one that EPA is really struggling how to control. How to reduce that risk to something that's acceptable. So there are no ethylene oxide emissions here in Louisville. There is a source in Brandenburg, Kentucky, of ethylene oxide. And this rule will substantially reduce emissions from that source. For EPA's work here, just put things into perspective, they are concerned about those ethylene oxide emissions because there's a lot of them. They're much riskier than they expected. For chlorophyll, because there's only one source now in the nation, they are concerned about 41,000 pounds in total of chlorophyll emissions. And they found those to be too risky. So again, there were a lot here. There are no more now. One thing, next slide please. One thing that you'll see here, I think this is helpful for those of you who weren't here at the table uh, when STAR was adopted, is that STAR is really unique. It's not a one-time assessment. We don't look at a company and say, well, your emissions are good. We look at STAR constantly. We look at it initially as part of the STAR program. We look at it any time that the company wants to build something new or modify use of equipment. And the unique feature of STAR is that it doesn't allow them to grandfather in that equipment. Their cumulative total for all tax that are emission, toxic air contaminants that are emitted from that equipment no longer can be 7.5 in a million. They drop to 3.8. And so we are continuing to push down emissions. We look at STAR every five years when we do a renewal operating permit. We look at STAR when there are excess emissions. You look at STAR when a company submits their annual report, their semi-annual report, their stack tests. So we look at STAR whole. For vinyl chloride, during the West Louisville Air Toxic Study, about 7,000, almost 8,000 pounds of vinyl chloride in the air shed. Over time, that's reduced to about 1,100 tons now. We did have another source we left. What you see in the state, is that those emissions have increased over time. There is no super program to continue to evaluate those emissions to be sure that they remain low. And in fact, today, that green bar at the end represents 116,000 pounds of vinyl chloride. That's from 2021. Are there any questions about those chemicals, STAR, or that history of the board? You know, from a national perspective, they obviously look at which happened here is that people move, which is beneficial to the community, but it's got to be worse for the places they go. And how do they incorporate that? Well, them? and that's a really good point, Stephen. I'm glad you brought that up. APCD is able to go beyond the federal air toxics program. What you see demonstrated here is the application of that regulatory program to go beyond the federal rules. So we're on a downward trajectory with our emissions. In places where they are following the federal air toxics rules, they are able to admit this new proposal will have a tremendous benefit in reducing emissions, particularly in Texas, Louisiana, but they don't go beyond that federal air toxics program. And that's why SAR is so important. Are there any other questions? Is there a map that shows you where the locations are Kentucky listed in there somewhere? It's listed. All 10 are listed. They're primarily, with the exception of the source in Brandenburg, they're primarily in Calvert City, Marshall County. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. A lot of the details here. The fence line monitoring is the easy part. But can you wrap their head around that? And that is going to apply here in Louisville. There are going to be tighter requirements for emission sources of ethylene oxide and chlorophyll pollutants, and those who are primarily driving cancer risk here. There are new emission limits for dioxin and purines that are not currently regulated, and this proposal will remove the general exemptions from emissions control equipment during periods of startup, shutdown, and malfunction. That's a really good thing. While in 2005, as part of the STAR program, we changed our regulation 1.07, excess emission reporting rule, to remove uh, 
general exemptions, they still exist in some of the federal rules. And EPA has begun to pull those back. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. For those of you who are interested in the, the reading details, this does include descriptions of how the proposed rules will impact process bed controls and ethylene oxide service, storage vessel controls, equipment lead controls, heat exchange system controls, wastewater controls, maintenance vent emissions, app flares, and also um, pressure relief equipment. With respect to flares, EPA has done a national study and determined that flares are not as efficient as they appear to be on paper if they're operating poorly. And as a result, this proposed rule also has a fair amount of uh, operational uh, or practice standards for those equipment. But my two colleagues just flipped themselves a look. So do you want to clarify anything for me? You just said things don't work well when they're not operated properly, and then kind of goes for all the that's it's a simple statement, but it is true. Okay, next slide, please. Finally, this is from US EPA's April 13th presentation. I heard a lot from them this morning. But for them, the sources in the native green rubber production source category will also be required to make some changes to process bed controls, particularly for emissions of floor green. Again, storage vessel controls, wastewater streams, um, maintenance vent emissions, and again, facility wide emissions caps for all units, it sets up cap over the entire facility of what those emissions can be, and that's 3.8 in the So that's a whole lot of, there's a lot of there there. Uh, ABCD will likely be making comments. We'll definitely be asking for more time. We have substantive comments by that time and whether they're necessary to share with the PA, we'll do so and provide a copy to the board. But this is unique in a number of ways. Again, that risk assessment is different. The fact that this is really focusing on multiple pollutants from a single source category, and there are many different types of facilities in that source category. And then, of course, that they're focusing on fence line monitoring. So with that, are there any questions? You know, have any group for all of that trade group or anybody else who has something that's a little more easy for public to look at? But other than that, I know you said there was an 89%. That's just for the risk assessment. So yesterday, US EPA held a public hearing, and there were some phenomenal speakers who presented during that uh, public hearing and had great three-minute sound bites of concerns. There are some articles. Uh, they're about as cutting into the, they cut as far as, as what I've gone over this morning. It's just really a lot to dig into. I'm hoping at some point that I can pull together what I've got scribbled down on a bunch of pieces of paper to put together more of a, a chart. The important things here, next slide, please, are really the time frames, and that is EPA has the public comment period open until June 26. There is a link to EPA's webpage. Go there and you can make your comment right there. It's the easiest way to do it. Um, but they hope to finalize this rulemaking in March of next year. They will then require fence line monitoring a year after that. And then three years after that, those equipment provisions will kick in from a public standpoint and an agency standpoint. Uh, I can understand a timeline. That, that I understand well. And so some of the comments yesterday were hurried up. A few of them were maybe take a little longer to get it all implemented so you're sure you're doing it right. Um, all good comments. So if I find something that, that is really helpful, I'll share it with the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if uh, I am done, if there are no questions from you all, Matt Mudd is going to share Air Quality Action Partner Program updates for 2022.
Thank you, Rachel. Absolutely. So uh, like uh, Rachel said, I have the pleasure this morning of providing an update on our air quality action partners program. As well as recognizing our partners that have certified the commitments that they made in 2022. So uh, go forward a couple of slides for me. So first we'll do a quick recap of the program. Uh, as we stated before, the Air Quality Action Partners program was developed based directly on recommendations made by the multi pollutant stakeholder group that was formed in 2019. The goal of the program is to encourage businesses and recognizes businesses that make voluntary commitments beyond what is required by law to reduce emissions and increase air quality awareness, particularly on days when an air quality alert is issued. So starting the program was started in 2021 specifically for businesses subject to an APCD permit. After that first successful first year, uh, the program was open to all Louisville businesses. So anyone is able to sign up. So uh, a quick look at the levels of air quality action partners for those non permitted businesses. They can sign up to be a regular air quality action partner, which we certainly encourage. If you're a permitted facility, a source of air pollution uh, subject to an APCD permit, you can sign up to be that regular air quality action partner, or you could also make more substantive, more meaningful commitments to be recognized at higher levels. Here we have the silver level partners, gold level partners, and platinum level partners. So a brief look at what these commitments are. We have what we refer to as our tier one commitments, which would be signing up to receive air quality alert day notifications from the air pollution control district. And having a system to notify your employees on site of those air quality alert days. So, and also encouraging those employees to sign up for notifications. We have what are called our tier two commitments. That's a wide variety of commitments that are sorted into three separate categories, as you see there. That would be stationary source equipment operations and emissions. That could be anything like solvent best practices for low to the emit low VOCs, things like that. Vehicle and fleet emissions, that's idle free policies, uh, purchasing low emitting equipment, low emitting vehicles, things like that. And then we have facility and building related emissions. That's uh, purchasing low emitting uh, maintenance equipment or, uh, you know, uh, running, changing operations on air quality alert days, things like that to lower emissions. And then you have what's called a tier three commitment. That is basically at the end of the year, quantifying the emissions reductions that resulted from those commitments and showing them to us. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see how kind of those levels break down. Every single air quality action partner uh, must complete those tier one commitments, which is signing up to receive those air quality alerts and having a system to distribute them to your employees. On top of that, Regular air quality action partners, uh, non permanent businesses must make at least 1 additional tier 2 commitment uh, and permanent facilities must make at least 2 additional tier 2 commitments to be recognized as an air quality action partner to be a civil level silver level partner and a reminder those. Any only permanent facilities can be above a air quality action partner uh, to be a silver level partner at least 1 commitment for each tier 2 category, which would be 3 total. To be a gold level partner, uh, you have to complete all silver commitments and quantify those emissions reductions, that tier three requirement. And then to be recognized as a platinum level partner, you need to commit, uh, commit to all gold commitments and meet the certain specific reduction goals. When we feature our, our platinum level partners in a moment, you'll kind of see some examples of what that means. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, take a brief look at our the numbers of facilities that have certified their 2022 commitments so far. So we have four facilities that have certified as platinum partners, five at gold, 10 at silver, and we've had four facilities and non permit facilities certify as air quality action partners. Some highlights from 2022 uh, emissions avoided due to actions taken by our partners uh, include at least six tons of particle pollution. 100 and Three uh, tons of nitrogen oxides, NOx, uh, 6.3 tons of volatile organic compounds, as well as the additional 
uh, emissions avoided of other hazardous air pollutants and greenhouse gases. We know that many additional employees, residents in the area are receiving air quality alerts on air quality alert days as a result of this program. And last year, which we've noted to you before, the Air Quality Action Partners Program was recognized as a best practice in air pollution control by the Association of Air Pollution Control Agencies. So that's certainly something we're proud of. So we'll take an, I forgot to include this, there's a map there. It's a little bit tough to tell, uh, but when we send this to you afterwards, you can take a look. That's a map of our facilities and businesses that are Air Quality Action Partners that have certified so far their commitments from 2022. So we'll take a brief look through some of our platinum and gold level partners to recognize them for their commitments last year. Uh, first, we have American Synthetic Rubber Company recognized as a platinum partner. Some highlights include installing idle free signage on their property, deferring groundskeeping, maintenance, and construction on air quality alert days. And their platinum commitment was to reduce facility wide emissions to find particle pollution by at least 5%. And then Acmix 10 Inc., uh, they have also been certified as a platinum level air quality action partner. Highlights include establishing low emissions purchasing policies for stationary equipment, new on road vehicles, and for non, -mobiles, non road mobile sources like groundskeeping and construction equipment, installing idle free signage, and establishing idle free policies, deferring activities on air quality alert days and getting a pollution prevention and or energy efficiency assessment from the Kentucky Pollution Prevention Center and implementing a reduction strategy. Their platinum commitment was to install new low NOx burners on boilers or heaters. Next slide, Eckhart America Corporation, also recognized as a platinum level partner. Highlights include establishing and enforcing solvent management best practices, installing idle free signage and establishing idle free policies, and their platinum level commitment was to reduce facility wide emissions of fine particle pollution by at least 5%. Next slide, please. And we have Altaglass International. Highlights include rescheduling discretionary emission generating activities such as maintenance and testing to avoid emissions on air quality alert days, establishing and enforcing idling restriction policies, and deferring mowing and groundskeeping activities on air quality alert days. Their platinum commitment was to postpone production, surface coating, or other regular operations on air quality alert days. Now to our gold level air quality action partners that have certified their actions from 2022. The Kenworth Company uh, highlights include optimizing combustion and pollution controls for emissions reductions, particularly on air quality alert days, establishing and enforcing idling restriction policies, and deferring mowing and groundskeeping activities on air quality alert days. Next is, no worries, the slide is not moving. Oh, there it is. Eden Corporation highlights from 2022 include rescheduling discretionary emission generating activities such as maintenance and testing to avoid emissions on air quality alert days. Educating fleet users on driving and equipment operation practices that can reduce emissions and taking actions to conserve energy on air quality alert days. Lubrizol Advanced Materials, as a gold level air quality action partner, their highlights include enforcing an idling restriction policy for delivery vehicles and on site contractors, switching remaining generators' uh, auto exercise schedule from day to night. That is one that uh, I, did I get that sound like that's correct? Uh, some technical people uh, and uh, reducing their steam usage through using a pro through process changes. Uh, Roman Haas highlights include optimizing combustion and pollution controls for emissions reductions, particularly on air quality alert days, establishing and enforcing idling restriction policies, and deferring mowing and groundskeeping activities on air quality alert days. And our last Gold uh, level air quality action partner that has certified their 2022 commitments is Young Chemicals. Uh, highlights include deferring mowing and grounds keeping activities and rescheduling discretionary emission generating activities such as maintenance and testing on air quality alert days and encouraging employees who can telecommute at least once a week to do to telecommute at least once a week and on air or all air quality alert days. So uh, 
our silver level, silver level air quality action partners that have certified their commitments from 2022 are All Next USA, uh, Boardwalk, Texas Gas, Clarion Corporations, South Plant and West Plant, IMI Kentucky, MPLX Terminals LLC, their Algonquin Terminal, and Kramer's Lane Terminal, for Public Conduit Manufacturing, <laughs> uh, Snap On, and Universal Minerals Kentucky Incorporated. And our air quality action partner businesses and facilities, Jefferson County Public Schools, Lambert's Paint and Body Shop, Marathon Patrol and Company Can Run, and Valcor Environmental Services. So the next slide, uh, uh, signups for 2023 are still being accepted. Uh, we have a sign a sign up form on our website that makes a lot of this easy. So if you ever have are curious, it, you know, if you select what level you want to commit at. A drop down menu with certain options comes up for you. So we certainly encourage businesses and facilities to look at that sign up form, see what's possible for them to do. Even if you're already doing uh, air quality friendly actions or emissions reducing actions, we'd love to recognize those. So that's what this program is built for to encourage and to uh, celebrate the actions that are already taking place. So we have to received 29 total commitments so far. And uh, Based off of what these partners have told us, that will mean at least 2,700 employees will be receiving air quality alerts because of their commitments. So that's great news and certainly something we want to get the word out about. If no one else has any questions. That's it for today. Any questions? Thank you, Matt. Excellent. Thank you. Matt. Director Hamilton, is that the end of your? That is the end of my report. Okay. Thank you very much. Very informative, very deep. I'm sure we all got it. Um, moving on to the um, air quality data report. Uh, any questions on any of those? The air quality data environmental staff report, access mission report, and the complaint investigation status summary. I got a question. On the ozone report, I noticed that the difference between there's a pretty significant increase in just one day's difference across the board from the 19th of April to the 20th. Was that a special event or was that just normal? Um, it, it can be quite normal ozone, something that precursors can build up over a period of days. And so it would become the next day can start with more precursors already. Okay. The sunlight can grab it up faster. Okay. Otherwise, the data seem, seem good. I don't know if that's the right way to say that or not. Yeah, knock on wood. Any other questions or comments from the board? Um, also, these reports are distributed electronically. You need to take a look. I've now adjourned uh, the regular meeting of the board and thank you for your participation. The next meeting will be Wednesday, June 21st at 10 a.m. Thanks for your attendance. Dr. Garst, before you go, your